The country of Australia is comprised of the continent's mainland, as well as Tasmania and many other smaller islands. Human habitation of the Australian continent is estimated to have begun between 42 and 48,000 years ago, possibly with the migration of people by land bridges and short sea crossings from what is now Southeast Asia. Australia may well be the home to the world's first people with a population numbering as high as 750,000 people before the arrival of the Europeans. In 1971, stone tools were discovered in a quarry near Penrith, New South Wales, to show that humans lived in Australia at least 12,000 years before they first appeared in Europe. To put this in perspective, since the first fleet of Europeans arrived in Australia in 1788, there have been only eight generations of settlers. On the other hand, there have been in excess of 18,000 generations of Aboriginals. The first Aboriginals found an Australia that offered a better environment than today. Large animals, now extinct, provided more meat than the animals with which we are familiar. Some parts of the continent were richer in vegetable foods, but the land contained no cultivated crops or animals that could be domesticated, such as cattle and sheep. Australia is the world's largest island and its smallest continent. It is the driest land mass overall, with much of the centre being desert. It has rainforests along its coasts and the north is tropical with bountiful rivers and vegetation. Inland, the quest for water is a constant struggle. In most areas, Aboriginal people survived where others would have perished and had to spend most of each day hunting or foraging for food. They drained dew and obtained water from certain trees and roots, adapting cleverly to the harshness of the desert interior. They memorized the locations of natural waterholes and shared this knowledge through folklore and ritual. The Sydney Harbour Bridge, 2.4 kilometres long, is the iconic image of Sydney, nicknamed the Coat Hanger because of its arch-based design. There had been plans to build a bridge as early as 1815, when convict and noted architect Francis Greenway reputedly proposed to Governor Lachlan Macquarie that a bridge be built from the northern to the southern shore of the harbour. In 1825, Greenway wrote a letter to the Australian newspaper stating that such a bridge would give an idea of strength and magnificence that would reflect credit and glory on the colony and the mother country. It took more than 100 years of much planning and discussion before the bridge actually opened in 1832 to carry a railway, motor vehicles, bicycles and pedestrians. At last, Greenway's dream had come to be. The total cost of the bridge was £6.25 million, pounds, a debt that wasn't repaid until 1988. The Labour Party Premier of New South Wales, Jack Lang, was to open the bridge by cutting a ribbon at its southern end. However, just as Lang was about to cut the ribbon, a man in military uniform rode in on a horse slashing the ribbon with his sword and opening the Sydney Harbour Bridge in the name of the people of New South Wales before the official ceremony began. He was promptly arrested, the ribbon was hurriedly retied and Lang performed the official opening ceremony. The colourful horse rider, Francis de Groot, was convicted of offensive behaviour and fined five pounds. The Sydney Opera House is a multi-venue performing arts centre conceived and largely built by Danish architect Jørn Utzon. It opened in 1973 after a long gestation period that had begun with his competition winning design in 1957. The Opera House has a modern expressionist design with a roof evocative of a ship at full sail created from a series of 2,194 large precast sections of concrete that create the shells to shape the roof line. Sydney's Opera House is described as an artistic monument to creativity. It is one of the most recognisable landmarks in both Sydney and Australia and is a UNESCO World Heritage Site. 
The Sydney Opera House is among the busiest performing arts centres in the world, hosting over 1,500 performances each year and attended by some 1.2 million people. The original cost estimate in 1957 was $7 million, with a completion date set by the government for the 26th of January 1963, Australia Day. The project was completed 10 years late and over budget by more than 14 times the original estimate. All this was blamed on the architect. The Opera House was formally opened on October the 20th, 1973 by Elizabeth II, Queen of Australia. The opening was televised and included fireworks and performances of Beethoven's Symphony No. 9, the Choral Symphony. A large crowd attended, but the architect, Jürgen Utzon, was not invited to the ceremony, nor was his name even mentioned. Then, in the late 1990s, the Sydney Opera House Trust began to communicate with Jürgen Utzon in an attempt to effect reconciliation and to secure his involvement in future changes to the building. In 1999, he was appointed by the Trust as a design consultant for future work and in 2004, the first interior space rebuilt with an Utzon design was opened and renamed the Utzon Room in his honour. In April 2007, he proposed a major reconstruction of the Opera Theatre. However, Utzon died on the 29th of November in 2008 before this proposal could be implemented. The Wangal clan of native people first lived on Sydney's Olympic site area and when the British arrived they called the area, with typical British understatement, the Flats. The Olympic site has gone through numerous transitions. In 1807 it became part of the Newington estate developments and much of the land was reclaimed from the river and wetlands with landfill. In the late 19th century, the government acquired some of the land for an aged women's home. It was later a brickworks, an abattoir, an armaments depot, as well as the site for eight of Sydney's rubbish dumps. In the mid-1980s, an area was promoted as a technology park called the Australia Centre. But the idea did not catch on. A decade later, the entire area became the site for the Sydney 2000 Olympic Games, with the Olympic cauldron high off the ground, like a fountain with water flowing from its lower flutings. The V-shaped forest of 480 poles, inspired by Stonehenge in Britain, laid out at the eastern end of Olympic Plaza, is unashamedly a nostalgic memorial for the Games, as it captures many of the elements that made the game special to the athletes, the volunteers and spectators by the billions who had watched and listened from around the world. On them are the names of 1,972 Olympic medalists and 2,627 Paralympic medalists at the Sydney Games recorded on gold, silver and bronze nameplates. King's Cross, an inner city locality of Sydney, first belonged to the Cadigal Aboriginal clan until 1791 when the indigenous people were decimated by smallpox outbreaks. Then in the early 19th century, the King's Cross Potts Point area was one of Sydney's most prestigious suburbs. The early decades of the 20th century labelled King's Cross district as Sydney's Bohemian heartland. Colloquially known as The Cross, the area became known as Sydney's Red Light District and reputed to be home to organised crime groups. Once known for its music halls and grand theatres, it was rapidly transformed after World War II by the influx of troops returning and visiting from the nearby Garden Island Naval Base. Today it is dominated by bars, restaurants, nightclubs, strip joints and adult bookstores. The illegal trading of alcohol, known as sly grog, was notorious in the area up until mid-century. At the turn of the 21st century, there have been demographic changes, as affluent professionals are increasingly residing in the area, and King's Cross has witnessed a large number of real estate developments, 
both refurbishments of historic apartment buildings and the construction of new ones. Sydney Harbour is often regarded as the best and most beautiful natural harbour in the world, encompassing 54 square kilometres of water with 240 kilometres of shoreline. Amid the exclusive homes that dot the water's edge, there are large tracts of parklands, reserves and gardens which balance the harbour environmentally. The vibrant blue harbour is dotted with hundreds of sailboats, cruise ships and ferries. The best way of seeing the harbour is to be on it, and the numerous ferry boats plying back and forth provide a perfect, inexpensive way to do it. Sydney was established in 1788 by Europeans as a penal colony, for on the 18th of August 1786, the decision was made to send a colonization party of convicts, military and civilian personnel to Botany Bay, not far from Sydney Harbour. Not long after their arrival, a catastrophic epidemic disease, now thought to be smallpox, spread through the Aora people, the coastal Aborigines around Sydney. The local Aborigines died in their thousands, and for months, bodies could often be seen bobbing on the waters of Sydney Harbour. The Kadigal and Wangal tribes and other surrounding peoples were decimated. During the late 18th and most of the 19th centuries, Large numbers of convicts were transported to the various Australian penal colonies by the British government to alleviate pressure on their overburdened prison facilities. During those 80 years, more than 165,000 convicts were transported to Australia, many of them having taken that option instead of the death by hanging, which was the alternative. Sydney has a number of great heritage buildings, Parliament House, Sydney Town Hall, the Queen Victoria Building and the Australian Museum among others. The first substantial buildings were designed for Sydney by transported convict Francis Greenway, who designed such buildings and structures as the Macquarie Lighthouse, Hyde Park Barracks, St James's King Street and Government House. Other prominent architects were James Barnett, who designed the General Post Office, the Customs House and various courthouses, and Edmund Blackett, who designed the Gothic Revival style St Andrew's Cathedral and St Philip's Church. Sydney's Royal Botanic Gardens overlook Farm Cove and lie to the east of the Sydney Opera House. The gardens are 30 hectares in area and were built on the first farm on the Australian continent. Although that farm failed, the land has been in constant cultivation since that time, as ways were found to make the relatively infertile soils more productive. The Royal Botanic Gardens are home to a colony of over 22,000 grey-headed flying foxes, a large species of fruit bat. The management of the gardens holds the batch responsible for killing dozens of trees and, in May 2010, received approval for a plan to move the colony elsewhere. In February 2011, a federal court ruling gave the Royal Botanic Gardens and Domain Trust the go-ahead to play recorded sounds in an attempt to drive the bats from the gardens. The sounds which include engine starting and metal pounding, was scheduled for implementation in May 2011 for two weeks. Further plans include the non-stop playing of rap music. The long-term outlook is unknown. The Blue Mountains is a mountainous region in New South Wales with its foothills bordering Sydney's metropolitan area. The Blue Mountains are densely populated with oil-bearing eucalyptus trees, so the atmosphere is filled with finely dispersed droplets of oil, which, in combination with dust particles and water vapour, scatter short wavelength rays of light, which predominantly cast a blue-hazed beauty over the landscape. The Greater Blue Mountains, roughly 10,000 square kilometres, was listed as a UNESCO World Heritage Site on the 29th of November, 2000. Wentworth Falls, located in the Blue Mountains National Park, 
is a spectacular three-tiered seasonal waterfall. It is one of the most picturesque falls in the region and begins where the Jameson Creek drops over the escarpment and plunges almost 300 meters over the upper and lower falls into a large pool before flowing down the creek into the Valley of the Waters. Charles Darwin, famous for his theory of evolution, visited Wentworth Falls in 1836 and Darwin's walk, which follows Jameson Creek to the Weeping Rock Track, where many special rare plants can be found, is named after him. In Darwin's own words, here is a view exceedingly well worth visiting. And he could not have said it better for sandstone cliffs, tall stands of forest, canyons, waterfalls, bushland, high ridges, spectacular escarpments and gorges shape this wonderland, where the silence is only broken by the sound of a bird or an animal scurrying through the forest. The Three Sisters at Katumba are an unusual collection of rock formations representing three sisters who stood respectively at over 900 metres tall and, according to Aboriginal legend, marks the spot where the three sisters were turned to stone. The Aboriginal Dreamtime legend has it that the three sisters, Meenie, Wimla and Gunadu, lived in the Jameson Valley as members of the Katumba tribe. These beautiful young ladies had fallen in love with three brothers from the Nepean tribe tribal law forbade them to marry. The brothers were not happy to accept this ruling and decided to use force to capture the three sisters, provoking a major tribal battle. This placed the lives of the three sisters in serious danger, so a witch doctor from the Katumba tribe took it upon himself to turn the three sisters into stone to protect them from any harm. This seems like a curious decision, but the witch doctor had every good intention to reverse the spell when the battle was over. However, Murphy's law struck, and during the combat, the witch doctor himself was killed, thus preventing the return of the ladies to their former beauty. Now the sisters forever stand, somewhat disgruntled, together in their magnificent rock formation as a reminder of this battle for generations to come. The Blue Mountains consist mainly of a sandstone plateau dissected by gorges up to 760 metres deep. Mount Wirong is the highest point at 1,200 metres above sea level. When Europeans first arrived in Australia, the Blue Mountains had already been inhabited for several millennia by the Gundungura people, dating back 22,000 years. They tell the Blue Mountains creation story through dream time and of creatures Mirigan and Garangach, half fish and half reptile, who fought an epic battle which scarred the landscape of Jameson Valley. At Wentworth Falls, a rocky knoll has a large number of grinding grooves created long ago by rubbing stone implements on the rock to shape and sharpen them. There are also carved images of animal tracks and a cave which people had lived in long ago. Aboriginal music is very characteristic because of its most famous instrument, the didgeridoo. A wind instrument made from a termite hollowed eucalyptus branch, it extends about five feet, is end blown and trumpet like and produces a low vibrating hum. The Aborigines decorated this musical instrument with bright paints made from natural substances. The didgeridoo is played only by men to accompany singing and dancing during ceremonials and emits sounds like Australian animals such as the dingo or the kookaburra. North of Sydney is the city of Newcastle founded in 1804 as a place for convicts too hard even for Sydney to cope with. Now, as New South Wales' second city, it has a population of over a quarter of a million. After removal of the last convicts in 1823, the town was freed from the infamous influence of the penal law. 
it began to acquire the characteristics of a typical Australian pioneer settlement and a steady flow of free settlers poured into the town and hinterland. The river is the real reason for the city's existence, to transport the coal which lies in great abundance beneath the Hunter Valley upstream. Newcastle has long suffered in comparison with nearby Sydney and only recently years of accumulated soot has been scraped off the city's stately buildings. Riverside gardens have been created in front of the city centre and a former goods yard has been converted into a waterside entertainment venue. The once blue-collar town has shifted to tourism in a big way. The surf beaches are wonderful with sheltered sandy beaches around the rocky promontory at the mouth of the Hunter River. Newcastle has faced its challenges over the years, for it also experienced an earthquake measuring 5.6 on the Richter scale on December 28, 1989, which killed 13 people, injured 162 and severely destroyed or damaged a large number of prominent buildings. Then on June the 8th, 2007, the worst series of storms in 30 years battered the coastal regions of New South Wales, resulting in extensive flooding and nine deaths. High above Newcastle Harbour is Fort Scratchley, situated atop Flagstaff Hill, with its commanding position guarding the Hunter River. This land around Nobby's Head was first sighted by Europeans on the 10th of May 1770, when Captain James Cook, on his ship Endeavour, sailed up the east coast of Australia. Later, the first Europeans to set foot on the area, now known as Fort Scratchley, arrived on the 9th of September 1797. Two natural features dominated the early history of this area. Flagstaff Hill, for its height, which offered a prominent lookout, and for the seams of coal, which were readily accessible around its base. This defensive fort was built in 1882, after the Crimean War, which had stirred long-term resentment between Britain and Russia, to protect the city from a possible Russian attack. However, its guns were not fired in anger until the 8th of June 1942, when, at the height of the Second World War, the fort returned fire at a Japanese submarine. It was the only Australian fort to have engaged the enemy in a maritime attack. The Australian army left the site in 1972. With the discovery of coal, this region developed the first large-scale coal mine in Australia and the first large mine of any kind in the country. Mining began on Braithwaite's head using convicts' labour during the first European settlements of 1801 and 1804. In time, coal mining became an economic mainstay of Newcastle and the Hunter Valley. Now, most of the slag heaps have been grown over and beautified, the production of steel has ceased, but the docks are still functional, particularly with the through traffic of coal that is still brought from the Hunter Valley. Today, Newcastle has become the world's largest coal exporting port. Ironically, the city also has a reputation as one of the most environmentally progressive places on earth. Kempsey and its surrounding valley were first inhabited by the Dunguti people, who were a large tribe, yet usually organized themselves into smaller groups. They lived in harmony with the land and their pattern of life was governed by strict codes of conduct regarded as sacred, having been handed down through countless generations. Being in the bend of the river, about 10 miles from the sea, and being very low-lying, the area around Kempsey is subject to frequent severe flooding, the last one only in 2009. Consequently, the local authority is pursuing a policy of buying up low-lying land and moving houses to higher ground. Modern Kempsey seems sad, deserted and dusty, though the people are confident, friendly and hospitable. It's all in the eye of the beholder. European settlers were drawn to the area in search of the rich stands of red cedar. 
Kempsey thrived until the cedar resources were exhausted in 1842 and the land was then cleared for agriculture. The economy shifted towards beef, sugarcane, maize and dairy cattle. All largely failed, but ever enterprising, someone in Kempsey had a brilliant idea. And in 1974, Kempsey became home to the famous Australian icon, the Akubra hat. The Akubra is a wide-brimmed Australian bush hat of rabbit fur felt. Its name is derived from the Aboriginal word for head covering. Many Akubras have drawstrings to help keep them on the wearer's head on windy days, as well as adding to the hat's appearance. Australians need hard-wearing hats with wider brims to protect them from the sun and the rain. A Kubra soon became known for its durability and comfort and is recognised throughout the world. It offers Australian styling with a flair that reflects the independent, confident and sometimes adventurous spirit of the Australian dinkum, which is the Australian slang for genuine. Kempsey is an interesting town to walk around, offering curious waterworks assemblies and old buildings. And one can usually find, on most grassy areas, the bird most common to New South Wales, the ibis. The African sacred ibis was an object of religious adoration in ancient Egypt. The Australian ibis, very similar in appearance, has a predominantly white plumage with a bare black head, long down curved bill and black legs. These birds, on the other hand, are not considered to be sacred, are considered problem birds due to their strong smell. They are often cursed at with the usual Australian flair and their populations are being culled. The Doriga Rainforest has numerous walking tracks and is an area of exceptional natural beauty. Archaeological sites in the Doriga region show that people have lived in the area for over 5,000 years, using, during the cooler months, the subtropical rainforest as one of the diverse habitats within their tribal range. For thousands of years, the clan moved up the rivers during the warmer months of the year and camped on the grassland plains, using the abundant supply of foods, natural medicines and materials for hunting, gathering and shelter. They burnt the margins of rainforest to stimulate new growth and attract grazing wildlife, including wallabies. The Gambalamium tribe maintained sacred places and held ceremonies to plead with the gods to continue the rich supplies of animals and plants. Stone monuments and circles remain as evidence of these ceremonies. Bangalo palm fronds were used to make vessels for water and honey. The bark of the giant Dandarga, a stringy bark tree, was processed and the fibre pounded, then woven into fabric or used for hunting and fishing nets. The plateaus were known as Dandarga, a possible source for the name of this region, the Dorigo. Into the late 19th century, most indigenous Australians were hunter-gatherers with a complex oral culture and spiritual values based on reverence for the land and a belief in the dream time, a sacred era in which Aboriginal ancestors rose from below the earth to form various parts of nature, including animal species, bodies of water and the sky. The dream time, or the mythological past, was the time when spirit ancestors travelled throughout the land, giving it its physical form and setting down the rules to be followed by the Aboriginal peoples, with beings such as the Fertility Mother and the Great Rainbow Snake. The journey of the spirit ancestors is recorded in dreaming tracks across this vast continent. A dreaming track joins a number of sites which trace the path of an ancestral being as it moved through the landscape, forming its features, creating its flora and fauna, and laying down the natural laws. One of these spirit ancestors is the Rainbow Serpent, whose dreaming track is shared by many Aboriginal communities across Australia. 
Unlike other religions, however, Aboriginal belief does not place the human species apart from or on a higher level than nature. Aborigines believe some of the ancestors metamorphosed into nature, as in rock formations or rivers, where they remain spiritually alive. Every major geographical feature in Australia has an Aboriginal story behind it. The dreaming is very abstract, almost turning into another dimension. Aborigines believe that they are constantly living in the dreaming world, and that every time they do something, they leave an impression on the other reality that is the dreaming. Ayers Rock in the central desert of Australia is an example of a landform shaped by the ancestors. Cool, dark caves inside Uluru, widely known as Ayers Rock, have sheltered Aborigines for thousands of years. Although lacking a formal written language, for thousands of years Aboriginals have recorded their culture in rock art. Their art shows images of the environment, such as the plants and animals, including pictures of animals believed to have become extinct 20 or 40,000 years ago. Aborigines did not build large stone monuments, did not domesticate animals, and did not cultivate the soil for crops. Because they did not create villages, towns or cities, their culture has never been described as a civilization, yet it contains all the elements of a civilized world. Their great paintings, lengthy songs and dances with accompanying stories that continue for days like great operas, still remain. Law and order were strict and religion and spirituality was held in the greatest importance. Today, the Aboriginal people account for only 2% of Australia's population, with 32% of Australia's Aboriginals living in the Northern Territory. And Bloodawatch is a district lying in the Northern Territory and is home to a large Aboriginal community. It is a kangaroo dreaming site. Wilpenna Pound is a natural amphitheatre of mountains located north of Adelaide. The Pinnacles are a limestone formation contained within Nambung National Park. The Three Sisters in the Blue Mountains and Ayers Rock. These places are all sacred sites, being time fragments in Aboriginal mythology. Coffs Harbour has the most livable climate in Australia, nestled between a high mountain backdrop with dozens of unspoiled beaches. Coffs Harbour owes its name to John Corf, who named the area Corf's Harbour when he was forced to take shelter from a storm in the area in 1847. Its name was accidentally changed to Coff's Harbour by the surveyor for the Crown when he reserved the land in 1861. The mountains, dotted with banana plantations for which the town is famous, provides a stunning backdrop to the region's unspoiled landscapes. This region once belonged to the Gumbengir people, making the Gumbengir tribe one of the largest in New South Wales. Clement Hodgkinson was the first European to make contact with the local Aboriginal community when he explored this area in March 1841. The local language of the Gumbengir people was almost eradicated by the efforts of the white immigrants, but attempts have been made lately to revive the language and try to ensure its survival. The oral tradition of storytelling tells of the Aboriginal's vibrant cultural life over many millennia. Songs illustrate the dream time and other tales of the land, while dances and diagrams drawn in the sand accompany oral tales. Aboriginal art includes sculpture, bark and rock paintings, baskets and beadwork. Music plays an important part in Aboriginal culture and during ceremonial gatherings, or corroborees as they are called, a whole variety of different instruments are played to lead the dancing. There is the bull roarer, the clapping sticks, and the didgeridoo. The bull roarer is a long, slender, flat piece of wood with a string tied to it. When you twirl the string through the air, it makes a roaring sound. This instrument is often used during a so-called bunyip story. 
The clapping sticks are long pieces of wood that make a clicking sound, and the didgeridoo, when blown into, produces a low, deep, mesmerizing drone with sweeping rhythms. The aboriginals traditionally went hunting with three things. A boomerang, spear, and spear thrower. The men of the clan make two types of boomerangs, returning and non-returning. The returning boomerang, used only once to injure the animal, when thrown correctly will return and the thrower can catch it without moving. A non-returning boomerang has a wider curve and is used to actually kill the animal. Spears were, and are, very important and are mainly used for hunting, fighting and fishing. Spears are thrown with such speed and force that they are extremely lethal. Nambuka Head, another seaside town, offers breathtaking views that make a person feel they are in a real-life postcard of fabulous beaches and coastal scenery. It is the southern gateway to subtropical Australia and is a maze of boardwalks and informative storyboards. Outdoor graffiti colour the waterfront to tell of those who came before us. Some of the graffiti is tasteful, some is not, but it is all very colourful. The word Nambuka derives from a Gumbangia word said to mean entrance to the waters and the village was incorporated in 1885. In 1886 the Australian Gazette described the river as a fine mountain stream flowing through low swampy country well timbered with cedar and other valuable woods. It falls into the ocean by a narrow rocky channel about 14 miles north of Trial Bay and is navigable for small vessels that trade there for cedar the only export. With the reckless clearing of the land of all the cedar trees, dairying emerged, but it was only with the introduction of paspalum grass in the 1890s that the balance was tipped again in favour of success. However, this industry declined in the 1930s due to soil depletion, the economic depression and a shift to beef cattle. Then, tomato, banana and carrot growing developed in the Nambuka Valley during the 1930s. Mining was carried out in the interwar years. With the railway, Nambuka became a holiday destination for people in New South Wales. By 1936, furnished cottages were designed to let to holiday makers and this tendency was greatly accelerated by the development of highways in the post-war years. Then the first private caravan park was opened at Nambuka Heads in 1953. Nambuka's picturesque river estuary, the art on the V wall and the spectacular seafront are a delight for the traveller and nowadays the only industry here is tourism. The city of Grafton, established in 1851, is one of Australia's most beautiful provincial cities. The richness of the area was discovered by escaped convict Richard Craig in 1831, who was given a pardon and 100 pounds to exploit the wealth of the red cedars he found there. Word of such wealth did not take long to spread, and one of the early pioneers was John Small, who came to what is now Grafton on the Susan in 1838. Grafton is renowned for its graceful historic buildings, sporting and cultural facilities, its location on a bend of the wide banks of the Clarence River, its double-decker road and railway bridge which opened in 1932 forming a vital link for the Pacific Highway, and the tree-lined jacaranda trees. The jacaranda trees were not always there, however. On the 2nd of July 1879, Mr. H. A. Volkers, a Grafton seed merchant, was contracted to plant trees for the Grafton Council. During the 1880s, he was instrumental in the supplying and planting of the jacaranda trees of South American origin, principally Brazil. The town offers a magnificent spectacle 
when these hundreds of jacaranda trees open their brilliant lilac blossoms along Grafton's broad tree-lined avenues at the end of October and the beginning of November. At that time every year, a huge colorful festival is held in Grafton to celebrate the blossoming of these beautiful trees. One of the best ways to explore this vast country of Australia is by railway. With a one-way ticket from Sydney to Brisbane, we experienced the true wonder of Australia's countryside by visiting some of Australia's most historic country towns founded by gold miners and farmers. Our tickets allowed us to depart from the train and visit towns with old world charm, the simplicity of general stores and country pubs from yesteryear, then hop back on and continue our journey northward. For many thousands of years, Aboriginal people lived in what is now known as Brisbane. In 1823, John Oxley was the first English colonist to explore Brisbane, which was then selected by the penal colony of New South Wales as the location for a new jail, intended to house dangerous prisoners in a remote location. Brisbane, colonized in 1824, is named after the river on which it sits, which, in turn, was named after Scotsman Sir Thomas Brisbane, the Governor of New South Wales from 1821 to 1825. The original settlement was established in what is now the suburb of Redcliffe, but was later moved to a location further down the bay. Taking advantage of the local forests and land, the settlers soon started farming and grazing activities. By 1869, most of the Aborigines had been wiped out due to rampant disease and fighting, with just a few of them escaping with the help of Thomas Perty, an explorer who befriended the Aborigines at that time. Brisbane was known as a prison within a prison because, from Sydney, second-time offenders were sent here out of harm's way and far from any further temptation. Brisbane's metropolitan area extends in all directions along the floodplains of the Brisbane River, between the Bay and the Great Dividing Range. After 1837, free settlers moved to the area and campaigned to close the jail and to release the land in the area for agricultural development. Brisbane, Australia's third largest city, was for the longest time seen as something of a poor cousin to Sydney and Melbourne and regarded as a sleepy country town hiding behind a big city facade. In recent years, however, Brisbane has stirred from its slumber and is casually emerging as one of the most desirable places to live in Australia with an estimated 1,000 people packing their bags and moving there every week. Of course, locals have always known that Brizzy offers the perfect lifestyle, and it doesn't take visitors long to understand why. Despite the transformation into a sleek, cosmopolitan city, complete with world-class art galleries, a booming live music scene, and a fabulous cafe culture, Brisbane still retains the laid-back, easy attitude of a smaller community. No doubt, the lazy subtropical climate, the gently curving Brisbane River and the rich cultural facilities of its many neighbourhoods also have something to do with its appeal. People love Brisbane because it's a ritzy, booming city with a down-to-earth attitude. Brisbane is the capital city of the state of Queensland currently enjoying a colossal economic boom. For 150 years, the Queensland Museum has been discovering, documenting, preserving and sharing the state of Queensland's natural and cultural heritage. The Museum and Art Gallery offers an insight into Australia's historical and artistic past through its many collections. Many of the paintings, prints and other works on paper, sculpture and ceramics are by Brisbane-based artists, while intriguing and rare artefacts and objects in the museum's cabinet of curiosities draw on the collections of Brisbane's living heritage. 
the Queensland Museum is a place where art and artists come together to create a hands-on, interactive experience of the rich cultural life of this exciting part of Australia. In our experience, dog racing had been a CD fringe activity on the edges of respectability and lawfulness in the dingier parts of big cities in England. Greyhounds are the world's oldest breed of racing dogs, dating back 5,000 years. The physical attributes and speed of the Greyhound was so admired by ancient Egyptians that it was the only dog permitted to share their tents and ride atop their camels. In early Arabian culture, the birth of a pet Greyhound ranked second in importance only to the birth of a son. The Greyhound arrived in England over 3,500 years ago. It is believed that the name was derived from Greek hound because in ancient Greece also, the greyhound was the most prized and respected of animals. These dogs were the much esteemed companions of Queen Cleopatra and Queen Elizabeth I and the only dog to be mentioned in the Bible, namely Proverbs chapter 30, verses 29 to 31, which says, there are four things which are majestic in pace. The lion, which is mighty among beasts and does not turn away from anything. A greyhound, a male goat also, and a king whose troops are with him. It was Queen Elizabeth I who initiated the first formal rules of greyhound racing, calling it the sport of queens. Greyhound racing is no longer very popular in Britain. But in Australia, some 25,000 greyhounds are born yearly. Of this number, only about half reach naming and training age with thousands of greyhounds disposed of annually. Their short racing career may be only three to four years. Greyhound racing is one of the most popular sports in Australia and one doesn't even have to attend the track to place your bets. Greyhound racing is an immense success in Australia and dog tracks, as they are called, are everywhere. This is what drives the breeding of the thousands of dogs that are born each year. Laws have been instituted to control the export of these dogs and to protect them from inhumane treatment. But the ill treatment of the animals in some places still goes on. Brisbane's Lone Pine Koala Sanctuary was founded in 1927. It lies on 11 acres of land and is the world's first, oldest and largest koala sanctuary. This wildlife sanctuary, with the motto, the earth is not only for humans, has Tasmanian devils, wombats, echidnas and many reptiles. But it is the kangaroos and the koalas, Australia's premier icons, that the people come to see. The kangaroo is a national symbol of Australia. Its emblem is used on the Australian coat of arms and on some of its currency. Kangaroos are endemic to the country of Australia. They have large powerful hind legs, large feet adapted for leaping, a long muscular tail for balance and a small head. Like most marsupials, female kangaroos have a pouch in which their babies, called joeys, complete their postnatal development. Species include the eastern grey kangaroo, the red kangaroo, the swamp wallaby and the redneck wallaby. The larger kangaroos have adapted much better to changes brought to the Australian landscape by humans, while many of their smaller cousins are endangered but still quite plentiful. They are not farmed to any extent, but wild kangaroos are shot for meat, leather hides and to protect grazing land for sheep and cattle. According to legend, Lieutenant James Cook and naturalist Sir Joseph Banks were exploring the area when they happened upon the animal. They asked a nearby local what the creatures were called. The local responded, kangaroo, meaning I don't understand you which Cook took to be the name of the creature. Myth or fact, we do not know, but either way, the kangaroos are often colloquially known as roos. The kangaroo is the only large animal to use hopping as a means of locomotion. 
kangaroos have chambered stomachs similar to those of cattle and sheep, and they regurgitate the vegetation they have eaten, chew it as a cud, and then swallow it again for final digestion. Fights between kangaroos can be brief and brutal, or long and ritualized. Kangaroos had few natural predators. However, with the arrival of humans in Australia, at least 50,000 years ago, and the introduction of the dingo about 5,000 years ago, kangaroos have had to adapt. It is said that the mere barking of a dog can set a full-grown male boomer into a wild frenzy. Kangaroos and wallabies are adept swimmers and often flee into waterways if presented with that escape option. Once there, a large kangaroo may use its forepaws to hold the predator underwater so as to drown it. Kangaroo reproduction is similar to that of opossums, whereby the egg descends from the ovary into the uterus. There it is fertilized, quickly develops into a neonate, and emerges after only 33 days. It is blind, hairless, and only a few centimeters long. Its hind legs are mere stumps. Once in the pouch, it fastens onto one of the four teats and starts to feed. After about 190 days and getting familiar with the world by sticking its head out for a few weeks, it eventually feels safe enough to fully emerge. From then on, it spends increasing time in the outside world and eventually, after about 235 days, it leaves the pouch for the last time. The lifespan of kangaroos averages six years in the wild to in excess of 20 years in captivity, varying by species. Most individuals, however, do not reach maturity in the wild. From time to time, people have taken on the task of rearing an abandoned joey themselves. The rule of thumb says that if the joey is already covered with fur at the time of the incident, it stands a good chance of growing up properly. Lactose-free milk is required, otherwise the animal may develop blindness. These young animals will readily hop into a cloth bag when it is lowered in front of them, if at approximately the height where the mother's pouch would be. In 2003, Lulu, an eastern grey kangaroo, which had been hand-reared, saved a farmer's life by alerting family members to the farmer's location when he was injured by a falling tree. Kangaroo Lulu received the RSPCA Australia National Animal Valor Award on the 19th of May 2004. The wombat, another marsupial native to Australia, is a short-legged, muscular animal one meter in length with a short, stubby tail. Wombats dig extensive burrow systems with rodent-like front teeth and powerful claws. The wombat's pouch is backwards so that it does not gather dirt, covering its young when digging. Their extraordinarily slow metabolism, like the koala, makes them exceedingly lazy. The exotically named Tasmanian Devil is a carnivorous marsupial now found in the wild only on the Australian island state of Tasmania. No larger than a small dog, it is characterized by its stocky, muscular build, black fur, pungent odor, extremely loud and disturbing screech, keen sense of smell, and ferocity when feeding. Echidnas, small, solitary mammals covered with coarse hair and spines, are sometimes referred to as spiny anteaters. But of all the birds, mammals and reptile species, including the bearded dragon at Brisbane's Lone Pine Sanctuary, none captivates people's interest more than the koalas. They are easily found sleeping and clutching the branch of a tree. The koala, which is not a bear, is a cute, cuddly round ball of fur with sharp claws and a big nose with sensitive nose hairs to identify the best tasting eucalyptus leaves. Koalas, native to Australia, are related to kangaroos. Koala derives from the Daruk word gula and has been mistakenly said to mean doesn't drink. 
Koalas have pouches where, as in all marsupials, the newborns develop. A mother usually gives birth after 35 days to one joey the size of a jelly bean. At birth, the blind, naked, earless koala moves from the birth canal to its mother's pouch. Once there, it stays safely tucked away, growing and developing. After one year, the joey stops nursing and lives almost entirely on eucalyptus leaves. With over 700 species of eucalyptus trees to choose from, they are fussy eaters, eating from only 50 species and consuming between 200 to 500 grams of leaves per day. The belief that the koala is drunk on these leaves is actually a myth. Eating eucalyptus leaves, a very low energy food, combined with a very low metabolic rate, causes them to sleep 19 hours daily to conserve their energy, which makes them appear intoxicated. Because of their diet of eucalyptus leaves, they smell like cough drops. They have rough pads on their paws, sharp claws to climb trees, and a heavily padded bottom on which they spend most days resting. Like people, koalas have fingerprints. At least 4,000 koalas are killed by cars and dogs each year, but habitat destruction is the greatest threat to the koala's long-term survival. Life expectancy is about 17 years in captivity, and only 10 if left in the wild. Australia is one of the most intriguing countries in the world, situated the furthest from most westernized countries and is a wide, brown land that is home to some of the world's most painful and poisonous creatures. But doesn't this just add to the adventure? It is a tropical land to its north and subtropical at its south, with the largest barrier reef in the world. It is home to an Aboriginal population that dates back more than 48,000 years. Its immigrant people, starting as a British penal colony as recently as the late 18th century, has now, in the early 21st century, become one of the most energetic and successful societies on Earth. It is an arid land where one can easily get drawn into the magic dream time of the native people, the captivating, vibrant sounds of nature in the vast outback, deserts so red that they appear to be ablaze, the turquoise ever-moving sea that washes the never-ending shores and a gentle breeze that whispers through the eucalyptus trees. This, and so much more, is Australia.